Chapter 5. What Demons Do People often ask me if I believe that all bad things in life are caused by demons. Let's review some basic understanding of the spiritual conflict between God and Satan. Number one, there is a kingdom headed by Satan and populated by a very large number of demonic associates. Number two, these beings are out to disrupt God's workings as much as possible. Number three, they are especially concerned to hurt God's favorite creatures, humans, the only ones God made in his own image. But four, Satan and his followers can work only within the rules God has laid down for them. We know that Satan cannot do anything without God's permission. He seems, however, to have permission to do quite a lot. But there also seems to be a rule that says he cannot influence a person without a legal right. <clears throat> he can only take advantage of a right that is already there. He cannot cause anything without what is often called an entry point. Another way of saying this is that although he can piggyback on something already there, he cannot cause difficulty unless something is already there for him to build on. With this as a basic rule, then, the enemy sets himself to latch on to bad things to see if he can make them worse, and to push people to go overboard with good things in order to throw things out of balance. He looks, therefore, for both weaknesses and strengths to exploit, but he exploits each in different ways, and he knows things about us that we may not be aware of. I was once asked to give a series of talks for a group of charismatic vineyard pastors and their wives. As I stood up for my second talk, I felt an insistent pain in the left side of my lower back. Though we paused for a group of the pastors to pray over me, I could not go on and had to leave the platform. In a more private setting, another of the pastors prayed over me, and within an hour, I passed a kidney stone and was able to return to the group to finish my talk. Though I had never had kidney stone problems before, the enemy knew that one had formed and chose the time of my talk to take advantage of that weakness. I later had a similar experience while I was in the middle of getting several demons out of a missionary. Between sessions, the big toe on my right foot got very sore. During the next session, one of the demons said through her, I got your toe. He had found a weakness there and exploited it. It did him no good, however. We kicked him out anyway. How do we know whether something is the enemy or not? I believe at least two points can be made in response. Number one, since the members of the satanic kingdom are out to do whatever damage they can to human beings, we can assume that whatever problems arise, they will be there to exploit it. And number two, since satanic beings can only take advantage of conditions already there, we need to look for such conditions and deal with them. We cannot simply claim, the devil made me do it. The scripture always holds us responsible, even if Satan is involved. Peter was rebuked for the words that came out of his mouth when he sorry, Peter was responsible for the words that came out of his mouth when he rebuked Jesus and later denied him, even though the enemy was clearly involved. Apparently there were weaknesses, insecurity, fear, doubt in Peter that the enemy was able to exploit on those occasions to get Peter to do his bidding. If we are to be effective in ministering to the demonized, it is important to recognize the typical ways in which the members of Satan's kingdom go about their work. Paul could assume that the Corinthians knew the enemy's schemes. Unfortunately, the worldview blindness of most Westerners means that we have to be much more explicit in our day. We simply do not have the awareness that the scriptural writers had and that God expects us to have. The enemy does indeed prowl around like a roaring lion. He seldom roars, however, unless he is noticed. He is intelligent enough to work largely in secret among those who do not believe or barely believe that he exists. When we become aware of demonic workings, the representatives of the enemy are usually not too hard to spot. They are very predictable, not particularly creative, and often repeat the same tricks. One way to develop spiritual eyes to see demons is to study common ways they attack. We need to do this if the enemy is not to outwit us. After all, what good soldier goes into battle without first understanding the way his enemy operates? Let's take a closer look at the common tricks demons pull so we can become better equipped to fight them. 12 Tactics Demons Use Let's begin by looking at several kinds of activity demons encourage, either from outside or inside those they attach to. 
I consider it very likely that each of us has at least one demon assigned to work from outside us to spy out our weaknesses and exploit them. It is probable, then, that those who are the greatest threat to the enemy have more or stronger demons assigned to them. Demons seek to get into people. Presumably, they will have more opportunity to influence from the inside. If they cannot get in, however, they work from outside as best they can. In the list that follows, I will not distinguish whether the enemy's forces are working from the inside or the outside. My aim is simply to point to the kinds of things they seek to do from whatever position they can achieve. Number one, disruption. We can assume that demons are involved in every kind of disruption. I am careful not to use the word cause, since I believe their ability to initiate problems is very limited, if possible at all. Rather, they push, prod, tempt, and entice to get people to make bad or at least unwise choices. And when they find someone already in difficulty, they work to make it worse. If God were not actively protecting Christians and non-Christians alike, the accidents, fractured relationships, abuse, physical, mental, and sexual, and disruptions we experience would defy imagination. As we have noted, Christians are special targets of the enemy. Rita Cabezas, a psychologist friend of mine, discovered this fact right from a demon's mouth. A non-Christian psychologist observed her session with a demonized Christian and asked the demon why he lived in the Christian woman rather than in him, the non-Christian. The reply was, you are of no interest to me. You already belong to the evil one. Evil is within you, deeply rooted. The demon even gave the names of four of the demons living within the man. Referring to the demonized Christian, the demon said, I'm interested in getting her. We are interested in possessing her and, pointing to two other Christian women, her and her. Earlier, the demon had said, I am interested in destroying, in tormenting her so she doesn't pray, doesn't seek God, so that she will fall away from him and be like the rest of them. I am in her mind, not within her, but in her mind. The aim of Satan's servants is to cripple and destroy as much of God's work as possible, whether it's happening through Christians or non-Christians. They zero in on individuals, groups, organizations, ministries, and governments, whether sacred or secular. They seek to produce strongholds where their strength is greater, perhaps because, they are, because there are more of them or because their tentacles are hooked more deeply into the person or group. Number two, temptation. Demons are probably the primary agents of temptation. It was probably demons doing Satan's bidding who tempted Cain, Noah and Ham, Sarah and Abraham, Shechem, Tamar and Judah, Joseph, and a host of others in scripture, including Peter, Judas, and Ananias. Demons apparently can put thoughts in our minds, and if there are demons already living in us, read our minds. Again, though, we are responsible for what we do with those thoughts. Since demons know what each of us is susceptible to, they will tailor the thoughts they put into our minds to our weaknesses. For example, demons seldom tempt a person in the sexual area who is not already vulnerable in that area, nor are they likely to tempt a non-religious person to go overboard in the religious area, or one unconcerned about money to become a miser. And it is unlikely that they will tempt a younger person with something appropriate to an older person, or that they will tempt a man with something appropriate to a woman. They constantly hammer away, however, and will do whatever it takes to tempt, in hopes that they can contribute to the person's failure. That is their job. Number three, ignorance. Demons seek to keep people ignorant of their presence and activities. This strategy is particularly effective in Western societies. Demons like people to be ignorant of their presence and love it when people do not believe they exist. Demons have repeatedly referred to this strategy during ministry sessions I have experienced. During a recent session observed by a psychologist who was learning about demonization, a demon became so angry it yelled, I hate it that she, the psychologist, is learning about us. For years we've been hiding and making them think we are psychological problems. The fact that demons piggyback on problems already in a person, rather than originating problems, enables them to hide quite effectively. If a person can explain the problem as resulting from natural causes, he or she may see no need to look further. 
Often, however, the function of the demon is to reinforce the problem in such a way that the person gets discouraged and stops fighting it. And the enemy and the enemy that the person never suspected was there gets a victory. Frequently, people say to me, I thought I just had to live with that problem. Or, since I knew the problem was generated by my dysfunctional family background, I thought there was no hope. And many do give up hope, thinking they are crazy or that nothing can be done about it. Demons delight in working behind the scenes, pushing people to react in dysfunctional ways and then encouraging them to blame themselves. Often I have ministered to people with spirits of fear that desperately tried to get the persons to fear me. Others have had spirits of deceit that pushed them to tell lies. Some have had violent spirits that tried to get the person they live in to be violent with me. These people have been amazed to learn that their responses were not simply their natural reactions. Through the years, they had gotten so used to such reactions that they thought the responses were completely their own motivations. Number four, fear. Another demonic tactic is to get people to fear them. If they cannot keep people ignorant, often their next strategy is to work on people's fear of what they do not understand or what they see as potentially embarrassing. In this regard, many of the stories that are told of dramatic deliverance experiences play right into the enemy's hands. The fear tactics that demons employ take many forms. I have ministered to people who feared they had a demon. This led them to assume that something must be very wrong with them spiritually. They did not realize that the presence or absence of a demon usually has little to do with one's present spiritual condition except to hinder it. Many of my clients have been very mature spiritually in spite of the impediments caused by the spirits inside of them. The people I have dealt with have more often become demonized through inheritance, some kind of abuse or pre-Christian involvement in the occult, than through spiritual failure and rebellion. In those cases, the demons in such persons have become very weak because of their spiritual growth. I have heard demons express great consternation over their inability to get a stronger grip on some persons because they are too close to Jesus. By contrast, people come from ministry who are afraid they do not have a demon. They often would like to avoid responsibility for their problems and are hoping to blame them on demons. These clients may be difficult to work with because they resist taking responsibility for dealing with the underlying garbage that gives demons a toehold in their lives. Others, however, have been told they must be crazy or permanently disabled, so they genuinely hope that a major part of their problem is demonic and therefore can be corrected. It usually can. Many people fear the power of demons. They have heard stories, seen movies, or talked to people who got involved in physical battles with demonized people. I have already mentioned the pastor who gave up dealing with demonized people when one threw up all over his office. When he learned that such a problem can be avoided simply by forbidding a demon to do it, he was willing to begin again. Most physical battles can be avoided in the same way, by commanding the demons to stop. The real contest is not a physical one. It is, a spirit, it is spiritual, and it is won through the use of empowered words, not muscles. When one realizes how little power the enemy has compared to that of God, very little fear should remain. We should never take the enemy lightly, but most of what looks like power on his part is deceit or bluff or both. He really has little more than the power given to him by the person he's in. If, then, that person's will is engaged against the demon or demons, then it is only a matter of time until the demon or demons has to go. Though a struggle may take place until the person's will is on God's side, as soon as the person's will has been given to God, the tough part is over. Most people who come for deliverance prayer have already chosen to turn to God for help. Number five, deceit. In all satanic activity, deceit is a major weapon. Jesus tells us that Satan is the father of all lies. I think that verse should be translated father of deceit, since it is deceit that is natural to him, and deceit may or may not involve lying. Satan continually aims to deceive anyone who will listen. He deceives us about who we are. He deceives us about who God is. He deceives us about who he is and what he does. As in Eden, he deceives through direct contradiction. That's not true. You will not die. Genesis 3, 4. 
but perhaps more often through indirect questioning, as when he asked Adam and Eve, did God really tell you dot dot dot? Who has not heard questions like these in their mind? Would a just God allow that to happen? Or, if he cared about you, would he have let you be born to these parents? Or, can I really be forgiven this easily? Or, am I really saved? These thoughts illustrate a favorite trick of the enemy, deluding people that such false ideas are their own. One thing I like to do during deliverance sessions is force demons to state some of the lies they have been telling. Clients are usually amazed to discover the source of much of their negative thinking, usually about themselves, others, and God, that has been keeping them in captivity. One woman, after hearing the demon report about 25 falsehoods, exclaimed, I've been hearing every one of those lies several times a day for all my life. Number six, hindrances. The job of demons is to hinder good by any means possible. Demons try to keep people from God or from doing something God wants them to do. They hinder unbelievers from believing. They also work to undermine the faith of Christians. Worship, prayer, Bible study, expressions of love, and acts of compassion are high on the demonic hit list. But the basic demonic strategy is to discover and attack weaknesses. Demons do not play fair. The greater the weakness, the more often a person is likely to be attacked in that area. Demons are like vicious predators who, smelling blood, keep after wounded victims until they can do them in. Failing a kill, they will settle for the maximum possible amount of hindrance. Number seven, accusation. Demons, like Satan, are accusers. Dark angels regularly expose people to accusations of every kind. A common tactic is to convince people to accuse themselves, others, and God of causing what may be causing whatever may be undermining their health, life, love relationships, and anything else that comes from God. The self-rejection engendered by Western societies provides especially fertile ground for satanic accusations. I cannot count the number of people I have prayed with whose major problem was their own inability to accept themselves. One woman, when asked why she felt she needed prayer ministry, simply said, I hate myself. Demons like to piggyback on such negative attitudes to get the person mired in self-accusation. They also like to plant thoughts that lead us to accuse others, including God. Demons encourage rumors, cultivate misunderstandings, and justify anger at and blame of God. Satan nags people into retaining guilt, convincing them that something is incurably wrong with them, even after they have confessed sin and been forgiven by God. He persuades people to blame themselves for abuse they have received from others. More, he strongly suggests that troubles are from God and are deserved because of one's failures. He is skillful, too, at leading people to blame others for difficulties they have caused. Among satanic whispers about God are, he's not fair, or he can't be a good God if he lets bad things happen, or his forgiveness doesn't come that easily. Self-accusations, once accepted, often lead a person into self-cursing or vows against themselves that the enemy gladly empowers. Many people who fall into self-rejection find themselves saying such things as, I hate my body, or my face, or my sexual organs, or my personality, or some other part of myself. Or, I wish I were someone else. Or, I will never be like, or I will be like, so and so. Or, if I can't measure up to such and such a standard, I would rather die. Such statements constitute curses and vows that must be renounced in the power of Jesus Christ if they are to be prevented from damaging the person speaking or thinking them. Western society's standards for the female body frequently are used by demons to get women to hate and curse their bodies or any part of themselves they believe does not measure up to the ideal. Those who have been sexually abused often believe the enemy's lie that it was their fault, leading them to curse their sexual organs or even their gender. They are often enticed into such statements as, I hate or resent or reject such and such parts of my body, or I hate being female. A woman I will call Jill came to me, distraught over the discovery of lumps in her breasts. As I asked God what to say and do, the word abuse came to me. I asked Jill if she had ever been sexually abused. Yes, she said, and indicated that her breasts had been the focus of the man's interest. 
Have you cursed your breasts? I asked. Yes, she said, many times, by strongly wishing, by strongly wishing that I didn't have them for men to be interested in. I led her to renounce the curses, and the next week the doctor could find no lumps. Accusations by the enemy are a major factor in many manifestations of self-rejection. Number eight, compulsion. Demons reinforce compulsions. They delight in helping people develop compulsions toward both good and bad behavior. A pastor's wife I will call Diane described her husband, Al, as compulsive in everything he did. Whether working, studying, making love, or ministering, Al went about it compulsively. One day while Al sat in one of my classes, a fairly strong demon made its presence obvious to him. After class, we were able to deliver Al from the demon. Three weeks later, during a seminar I was leading, Diane stood before the group to exclaim, I've been living with a different man these last three weeks. The compulsiveness is gone. Demons, of course, reinforce such compulsions as lust, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, overeating, anorexia, bulimia, pornography, gambling, materialism, competitiveness, and the need to be in control. What is not so obvious is that they also encourage exaggerated attention to many things ordinarily considered good. Among such compulsions are work, study, attractive dress, religion, doctrinal purity, family, achievement, and success. Many people who are strongly committed to these good things are, in fact, serving the enemy. The usual demonic approach to compulsion is to build on people's weaknesses and exaggerate their strengths. Compulsions often are rooted in fear, insecurity, and feelings of worthlessness. Demons are quick to exploit these attitudes to make the person compulsive. Number nine, harassment. A major concern of the enemy is disrupting people's lives, especially Christians' lives. He nips at our heels like an angry dog whose space has been encroached on. Satan is referred to as the ruler of this world, and he does not like it that those who belong to another king are wandering around in his territory, so he harasses Christians whenever and however he can. I do not know how much power demons have over the ordinary circumstances of life, but I expect that they do whatever God allows to disrupt our lives by influencing such things as traffic, weather, health, stress, relationships, worship, sleep, diet, and machines, especially cars and computers. I suspect, for example, that harassment was the aim of Satan when he ordered demons to manifest when Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, and that it was he who stirred up a storm while Jesus was in a boat on Lake Galilee, and that he influenced the Pharisees to continually persecute Jesus. When things go wrong, I have developed the habit of saying, if this is the enemy, stop it. It is amazing how many difficulties fade at that command. Demons like to influence churches and their congregations. How often have you found your mind wandering during the sermon, or had a hard time getting into worship, or struggled with a headache, or seen, heard, or thought of something that broke your concentration just at the wrong moment, or had a fight in the car on the way to church? Demons also like to influence pastors to run churches as clubs rather than as hospitals, to focus on intellectual sermons and programs rather than ministering to people, to preach theoretically rather than practically, to perform rather than to communicate. They push musicians to show off, nudge those who give announcements to interrupt the flow of worship and encourage ushers to be too obvious. In short, their goal is to weaken what God wants to do through the church. One of the demon's primary assignments is to harass Christians. Learning the enemy's schemes makes us aware of this fact and challenges us to learn how to counter Satan's activities. But Satan does not seem to harass every Christian equally. He seems to pay more attention to those who are the greatest threat to him and to those who do not have enough prayer support. Many Christians are so passive about their Christianity that they are no threat to the enemy. They may get off with very little attention from him. I even heard of a pastor who made a bargain with Satan that he would not preach against him if he did not cause a disruption in the pastor's ministry. His was certainly a wood, hay, or stubble ministry destined to be destroyed when tested by fire. How much better to be such a threat to the enemy that he feels it worthwhile to attack us.
How much better to hear our master say to us someday, well done. Those who threaten the enemy but do not have enough prayer support are also at risk of regular and effective harassment. Before moving strongly against the enemy, it is wise for us to get a number of people to support us in prayer, especially those with gifts of intercession. We will then take territory from him and frustrate him because we will have too much prayer protection for his attacks to get through. The fact that even Jesus was harassed and that weak Christians seem to be suggests that no Christian lives completely free from the enemy's attention as long as he or she is in his territory. The tactics listed above apply to demonic activity, whether coming from outside or inside a person. Predictably, satanic beings usually can attack with more intensity and effectiveness if they are working from inside. There is, however, good news. Even if we have demons living inside us, our continuing growth in Christ can diminish their ability to affect us. Furthermore, if we deal with the emotional and spiritual garbage inside us through counseling or prayer ministry, the grip of the demons can be reduced dramatically, even before the demons are cast out. Because the remainder of this book will deal on how demons behave when they live inside a person, I will not develop this topic further at this point. Number 10. Boldness. Evil spirits may become bold for tactical reasons. Boldness or confidence seems to be behind the appearance of demons as a dark presence that people can see or feel, usually at night. Such events often happen at home, in graveyards, or in places like Masonic temples or other buildings where occult practices are performed, over which the demons have obtained some legal right. Sometimes they will appear in what seems to be a dream. One woman who came to me experienced such a presence at night in the hallway outside her bedroom, but only occasionally when she did not expect it and her husband was away. The irregularity of the appearances and the fact that her husband was always away and that she had a small baby led her to become quite upset. In this case, and several other similar ones, we discovered that the demonic beings had a claim to the place where they appeared. This right often is based on some event that happened there. For example, pagan rituals, such as chanting or sacrificing, fortune-telling, or other Satan-empowered events like murder, the death of a demonized person, violence, or bloodshed. Any of these factors may result in demons continuing their residence. Such demonic activity may have a present cause if someone in the house gives permission. This invitation may come from a demonized person or be the outcome of occult activities, pornography, satanically empowered music, or other activity empowered by the enemy. Artifacts dedicated to enemy gods or spirits have demons in them, and tourists and military personnel often bring home from their travels authentic, as opposed to merely tourist, images or implements used in pagan rituals or dedicated to gods or spirits. Boldness may lead demons to speak audibly or nearly audibly inside the heads of people. Usually they can be fairly sure the persons will assume their problem is psychological and blame themselves, thus allowing the demons to continue their harassment undetected. Demons can, however, misjudge the person they are tormenting and end up getting cast out. When evil spirits are confident of their control, they may take over the person's body and cause shaking, fainting, blackouts, and fits. They can also cause people to speak in other voices. Such manifestations also sometimes occur when demons are confronted in the power of the Holy Spirit. Number 11, mistakes. Evil spirits often make mistakes. The kinds of demonic boldness described above can be mistakes if the person involved, if the persons involved know how to recognize them and go on the attack. This happened with the pastor who came to me describing voices he had been hearing in his head for some time. The demons probably felt the pastor would respond to the voices in fear, self-accusation, resignation, or some other way that would strengthen their grip. They probably also assumed the pastor was so unaware of their presence that he would not do anything to disturb them. They miscalculated, however, and now they are gone. Demons like to disrupt in a way that people do not recognize. Not infrequently, though, they miscalculate and attack people who understand how they work. That is when they get kicked out. 
I have ministered to several people who have experienced moderate to extreme difficulty in worship. Recognizing the work of the enemy, we have often been able to bring freedom from demons that made the mistake of getting too bold with the wrong people. Number 12, incrimination. Pressured by the power of the Holy Spirit, demons often incriminate themselves. In the chapters that follow, we will deal in detail with how to get demons out of a person. Here, though, we will simply note that in the encounter between their power and bluff and the power of the Holy Spirit, demons frequently freak out, come out of hiding, and reveal things against their will. For example, when a demonized person is worshiping God, not infrequently, the power of God forces the demons to reveal their presence by causing such things as shaking, physical pain, blanking out, or strange impulses. For example, a strong desire to run, a voice ridiculing the person, or thoughts of sexual activity. Similar things also happen when demons are challenged in the name of Jesus to release their grip on a person. Four Ways to Resist Demonic Influences whether a demon is inside or outside a person, certain things can be done to weaken its grip. These tactics do not necessarily evict demons living inside a person. We will deal with that process later. But certain things can be done to shut down or weaken demonic activity, whether from inside or outside, at least temporarily. Number one, spiritual growth. Spiritual growth weakens Satan's ability to work in or on a person. I have asked several demons why they did not have a stronger grip on a person. What they say can be summed up in the words of one of them, she is too close to God. Though it often does not seem to get the demons out, a demonized person's spiritual growth does weaken demons to the point where they are easily evicted when challenged in the name of Jesus. And I suspect the demons' spirit supervisors may remove some of them when they are thus weakened. To grow spiritually, we need to spend time with God, both alone and in fellowship. Constant listening to and conversing with God at all times, as friend with friend, as child with father, as wife with husband, weakens the enemy's grasp. So does worship, singing, praising, and expressing love and dedication to our Lord and Savior. So does fellowship with other believers. So do Bible reading and memorization. So does being joyful, filling our minds with good thoughts, and practicing Christian behavior. The enemy is defeated, or at least weakened, when we behave as our king expects us to behave. Number two, removal of burdens. Demonic activity weakens when people give Jesus their heavy loads. Jesus says that all who are tired from carrying heavy loads are to come to him and receive the rest he promises as we cast all our cares on him. It is especially important to give him the load caused by our negative reactions to the hurts of life. We are to give him our anger, bitterness, and hateful feelings, and forgive others as we have been forgiven. As we have been learning already, if we take care of the inner garbage, even if the demons are not cast out yet, the enemy's ability to influence us, either from outside or inside, is considerably lessened. I believe the absence of inner garbage was what Jesus was referring to when he said, The ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. John 14, 30. Many people can get rid of such garbage by themselves through prayer. Others need the assistance of someone skilled in inner healing. <clears throat> Number three, direct command. In the name of Jesus, demons can be commanded to quit. As already mentioned, when I suspect enemy involvement, I have found it helpful to say something like, if this is the enemy, I command you to stop in Jesus' name. Since I do not always know whether demons are involved, I include the word if. But even though I use the word if, I am startled again and again at how often the activity ceases after I assume authority and command whatever emissaries of the enemy may be present to stop what they are doing. I live with the assumption that Satan and his followers are anxious to harass me and that they are constantly looking for ways either to induce things to go wrong or to piggyback on things that are already going wrong. So if I am snared in an argument or am caught in heavy traffic on my way to an important appointment or feel I am being cheated or am frustrated in a search for something lost 
or in being thwarted in travel arrangements. All these signal me to command evil spirits to get out of my affairs. Sometimes I say the words out loud, sometimes in my spirit, not out loud to another person, or I may have a bigger problem. Either way, the enemy hears what I say and obeys. Now, not every problem goes away when I do this, probably because demons are not involved in every problem. Many times when I am caught in heavy traffic, the traffic does not clear in response to my command. Recently, I was nearly an hour late for an out-of-town speaking engagement because, though I had allowed enough time, the traffic was unusually heavy. And I do not always find things I have lost right away when I command the enemy to bug off, though I usually do find them reasonably soon and with a good bit less frustration. But quite a number of things have changed when I have commanded the enemy in this way. Several times, changes have come about in airports and on planes. Once, when it looked like my wife and I would have to stay overnight because our plane missed a connection, the company scheduled a larger plane to accommodate the extra passengers, but only after I commanded any enemies to cease and desist. Perhaps it was chance, but perhaps my taking authority made a difference. Being the bluffers that they are, demons know that we Christians have more power available to us than they do, but they still try to put things over on us. And their strategy works unless we remember who we are and make use of the authority we have. Number four, asserting the truth. Since Satan attacks through deception, one of our best defenses is truth. When we hear a lie in our mind and accept it, we give our enemy a victory. When, however, we refuse the lie and assert the truth, he loses the battle. When we hear the untrue negative thoughts de demons plant in our minds concerning ourselves, others, God, or circumstances, we need to assert the truth. It is amazing how things change when we reject those thoughts and speak the truth. In response to, I am worthless, let me suggest saying, not true. I reject that thought. The truth is, I am a child of the Most High God. In response to, after what you've done, you can't be forgiven that easily. God requires more than that before he grants forgiveness. Try quoting and really standing on 1 John 1, 9, the truth about how God deals with our sin. Or recall and assert to the enemy Jesus' treatment of the woman caught in adultery, or Peter after his denials. In response to lies or exaggerations concerning others, refuse them, and in keeping with Philippians 4, 8, assert about those persons things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Assert the truth that God offers acceptance rather than rejection. Assert forgiveness for yourself or others when the lie is condemnation. Assert love and acceptance when the demons tempt you to hate and reject. Bless when demons tempt you to criticize or claim superiority over someone else. Assert scriptural, tr assert scriptural truth concerning questions of what God is like and what he is accomplishing. Continually resist the enemy by confronting his lies with God's truths. Eventually, he will tire of attacking you with deceptions. Jesus said his followers would do the works. He had been... Oh. Jesus said his followers would do the works he had been doing. To do those works, though, we need to know what our enemy is doing and how he is doing it. We know Jesus and we know ourselves. We know we have the authority and power to identify the enemy and defeat him. Let's do the works Jesus said we would do and win with him. Just a quick note that I am including in the description a link to a blog post I wrote detailing uh, specifically how this chapter helped me. Uh, I will have the link to the written blog post and the YouTube reading of it. Thank you.